All right, welcome to the Big Medi Speaker Series. Uh, whatever month we're in, March 2018 edition. So tonight we have uh, Vicki Richmond from Healthy Rivers Partnership and Project Blue River Rescue. Vicki's been working on Blue River for, I don't know, ever, over 25 years. Habitat restoration, river cleanups, uh, stakeholder meetings, you name it, she's been involved in it. And so she's going to tell us a little bit about the uh, history of the river and uh, some of the efforts that are going on. Vicki Richmond. <clears throat> You're much too kind. Um, for those of you that know me, um, I started this crazy thing that I choose to call a career by working on Blue River. Um, I'd always been a water kid, I lived in New Orleans as a child, and whenever you had a new neighborhood, you drained the neighborhood by building a canal, and we hung out in that canal until we saw an alligator, <coughs> and then told our parents that we, we told each other we would never tell our parents we saw an alligator, and we didn't. And when they drained that, many, many years later, they found a 12-foot alligator in that canal, and so we really did see an alligator when we were kids. So it made me realize that there's a lot more going on in the water than we ever really thought about. And when I started looking at my new town at Kansas City and looking at that river, um, especially from the perspective of Lakeside Nature Center where I was doing wildlife rehabilitation at the time, I needed a place to release animals. The Blue River was right there. And it was great habitat for all those things. So I started studying it. And that study accidentally turned into coordinating Project Blue River Rescue for 20 some odd years and, and led me to this, this crazy thing that, that I'm privileged to call a career. So I would like to tell you a little bit about the Blue River. I'm not much good at uh, slides with words on them. So I tend to do things that are real picture heavy. Um, Larry was quite surprised to see that my slideshow had 125 slides, so we'll just get started. Um, first of all, the, it, just to kind of introduce you to your Blue River watershed, um, the watershed covers both states, <coughs> Kansas and Missouri. It starts clear out uh, at the confluence of Wool Creek and Coffee Creek out here um, where the Overland Park Arboretum is, about 179th and Knoll crosses the state line at 150 mm, something like 9th and Kenneth Road right at Martin City and then flows all the way down where it exits and enters the Missouri River right next to the Bayer plant and Kansas City Power and Light. So it goes stem to stern. It covers all of downtown Kansas City. If you live in Kansas City, it's hard to get out of the Blue River watershed. Um, if you go to Independence, you're in Little Blue, if you go other, but if you're in Kansas City proper um, or any of the Johnson County suburbs, you're in, Kansas, you're in the Blue Watershed. Um, ten public school districts, three counties, over a million people live, work, and play in our watershed. So we have to kind of go back in history to, to see what started happening in our river, and, and um, Larry did some really great posters, a, a poster series called the, the Blue River Story. Some of these slides, like this one, like this, are directly out of that series. So we use these at festivals and things like that to talk to folks. But in the late 1800s, we were already developing in the floodplain of the Blue River. Um, we started off at, um, with uh, Kansas Nut and Bolt Company, or Bolt and Nut Company, which was on Independence Avenue, which is like considered at what, Second Street, um, in uh, the late uh, 1800s. So um, when we first started settling Kansas City, there were people who dreamed of this beautiful recreational trail that we would have here. And it was built on one side with the Car River, the Kansas River, which would be the western boundary, the eastern boundary of the Blue River, and then the Missouri River that connects the two. So you would have this loop that you could continually paddle back and forth all the way around. And that was like a really great idea until this thing called flooding started happening. 
and the uh, rose kind of lost a little of its flavor at that point. But it was a big deal to have these two rivers close together and connected by another big water source, which should have really been a boon to our city. Unfortunately, it wasn't. Um, we pretty much started managing that river hard the minute we got here. We started managing the blue. So there's not a lot of good photographs of prehistory. Mammoths and things did not carry cameras. So we were part of the Inland Sea. If any of you saw Dr. Gentile's presentation, a lot of what I know came from Dr. Gentile. Um, the limestone formation that begins here is called Bethany Falls Limestone. And along the Blue River is its southernmost border. So that type of limestone starts right here in Kansas City in the Blue Watershed. Um, so what we see in those limestone bluffs and in the chert in between are um, sea creature fossils. A lot of plants, occasionally a fish, lots of shells. Um, if you're a fossil hunter, my easiest suggestion would be to go to the Firefighters Memorial at 87th Street and Blue River Road and take a walk because I've never taken a kid there that didn't go home with a fossil. Um, the native people use the blue. We absolutely know that because of Indian Mound that exists right here in town um, in a park now that we've used. I'll show you some pictures of that later. And the sea of grass that you hear so much about didn't really start in Kansas City, but this was the fertile valleys that gave way to that big swaths of grass. So we were part of the inland, uh, a part of that sea of grass because these fertile valleys of the tributaries that fed the Missouri is where a lot of that seed stock came from. So that's kind of a little bit about our prehistory. Um, and then this is Indian Mound Park here. So uh, this is the view from the park looking back towards the blue. And it's noted in the Lewis and Clark journals that they saw a, uh, a matrix of savanna and oak complex with wetlands and prairies when they came through. So the Blue River was actually pretty important in, in uh, terms of the Civil War, and I will let the Civil War people interpret their history. They do it better than I. But um, one of the really important things was you had to get over the river. You had to cross it. And we did that on two fords. One was called Byram's Ford. The other was Russell's Ford. Byram's Ford is at 63rd Street, right where it crosses Blue River. And then Russell's Ford is at actually at Blue River Road and Prospect. And they both have historical markers. So here in the, you can see the little arrows of where the Fords were. There's Russell's and then there's Byram's. I don't know where Hinkle's is. But in between these two was the um, Battle of the Big Blue. And that's very well interpreted in the Westport Historical Society's um, Westport battle maps and things like that. I'll have a battle map um, later on in the presentation. So about as fast as we started developing, um, we started realizing what this river could do to us. And it is a flashy river. It always has been, it seems. And the more we've developed, the more hard surfaces there are, the more runoff there is, the faster it moves. So. The first major flood that we read about is in 1928, and it destroyed the uh, areas that were real important to commerce in Kansas City. A big industrial area was really taken out. 300 families were displaced, 15 forever, never were able to return. So um, 300 families <coughs> in the 1920s was a lot of folks in a neighborhood. So. <clears throat> that was in this first picture up here. And then down here at the bottom is um, near the General Motors plant. This was in 1990. Um, there was flooding all the way through the plant at that time. So the blue has always been a flashy river. It's always wanted to flood. Well, after these major floods, there was a big one in 28. Again, there was another really big one in 1961. And in 61, they decided to do something about that. So in 1934, I think, or 43, uh, Kansas City was part of a congressional hearing to talk about flood control and levee projects. 
the next year, the Flood Control Act passed, and we were one of the first cities to receive money from the Flood Control Act to actually build some levees. Kansas City currently has the highest levy protection on the Missouri of any place on the lower river, on the lower Missouri River, and that kind of tends to turn itself around on the blue. The farther down you go, the heavier the levy protection has to be because the more water's coming their way. And so places like KCPNL and Bayer are highly fortified to keep that river where it needs to stay, to keep the blue out of their yard. Oh, okay, so this was after a flood. And as you can see, all the little boats are piled up over here, over here. These are little summer places that have been destroyed. This is, um, I wish it was bigger, some of the documentation out of a variety of studies, of engineering studies on levee work came out of those 1961 floods in Kansas City. So we were used as a test case to teach other cities how to deal with their water problems. And uh, this was a big part of, um, Kansas City was a big part of those studies to try and see how things worked and worked better. Um, I am not sure that this is Kansas City, but when I saw the last resort and that bridge, I just had to put it in there. It was just too great. <clears throat> so again, um, we have used the floodplain of the river to our benefit, and the river keeps wanting to take it back. And so once again, we're now in a position where we're going to have to do something about the river. In 1928 was one thing, 300 people, 300 families were displaced. By 1961, that was thousands. So we knew that, that some things had to happen. So the early 1900s, let's back up to before we developed the way that we have today. In those early 1900s, the blue was the place to vacation in Kansas City. Swope Park was far out of the settled city. People would take their motor cars down to the park and have a picnic, and that was a pretty big deal for your family to be able to do that. So um, we were already using the river as a recreational resource, and that went on for years. This is my favorite part of the presentation up here because this is all the good pictures. In 1912, George Kessler, who was kind of a visionary, um, uh, landscape architect who wanted to make the exterior of the city as beautiful as its buildings and um, architecture. So he had a program of boulevards and parks that was just beautiful. There was a series of five lakes that were slated to be built on the blue. If those lakes had been built, we would have had very little flooding further on down the river. But because they were not, we have fought that flooding for years. So this was Mr. Kessler's original plan. You can see those lakes that he was going to put in. Um, and then these are the projects that actually got built. They actually rejected the lakes plan, and the channel was modified to carry more water. So rather than store the water, they just decided to get it out of here faster. So when we talk about the settled city, this was it. This is Swope Park. So all the way down at the bottom, way out of where you would want to live because you'd want to live up in here, here's the blue, still back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then it just kind of drops off the world into Swope Park. We didn't really map it a whole lot farther than that because we were so far out from the city, there was no reason to go that far down. This is uh, what that looked like. This was um, a pretty routine site along Blue River. Can you imagine seeing that on Blue River? I know. I know. I'm, I'm on the blue all the time. I just can't even imagine it. But this was a sandwich shop. And they sold lunch. And you could go and get your lunch and sit on the bank and watch the river go by, or you could rent a canoe and paddle for an hour while you were having your lunch or whatever, but that was a burger barn. That's Blue River. That's Blue River. There's that same shot. And then again, we're starting to look at Brush Creek before the flood control project started being built. 
So Brush Creek is a big tributary to Blue River. It comes in right about the middle of the Missouri Reach. Um, you guys will know Brush Creek from the plaza. The plaza flooded in the 70s. Terrible, terrible situation. They actually created a series of lakes on the plaza. So that pretty river that runs through the plaza, Brush Creek, is really a series of lakes there. And they're designed to store water. Um, what we did at Brush Creek was allow the channel to carry more capacity. So instead of just being this little rut, it's been designed so that that water can really spread out and get up on both sides. So that goes back into Brush Creek. That's Blue River. That's the 15th Street Bridge. Can you believe that? These are postcards. I have a whole bunch of these. I just think they're fabulous. Look at him fishing. Seen on the river. So when we channelize rivers, this is what we do. We scrape off every bit of vegetation. We dig a new channel. We put the river in it. We armor the banks, and we expect the river to stay put. And for the most part, they don't. They tend to want to eat away at this riprap along the sides. They'll want to cut over the top of this. They'll want to do all kinds of things. So it's a constant maintenance issue. Levees are hard for cities to maintain. And then this is what Rush Creek looks like now. So this is actually south of Brush Creek. This is the area before any modifications were made to the creek. So you see all of this green space. And then we started doing the modifications. And then when we finished them, um, what did we do? We went ahead and just built up and then have little pockets of habitat restoration. The good thing is this habitat restoration. We've really tried to move from gray infrastructure to some green infrastructure. We have some pretty forward-thinking civic leaders here in our town that are listening. And uh, I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. So there's our from gray to green. So these are actually, this is actually a concept drawing. They were going to build this structure right behind Byram's Ford. It was going to be 50, what, 50 feet, 48 feet tall? Something crazy. It's huge. And... Uh, I was not as old or smart as I am now, and I said things like, why are you building that? Why would you do that? And, well, why wouldn't you just put in a whole bunch of small things instead of this one big thing? And so many years after I said those particularly brilliant things, I was handed a keychain after this big celebration of 40 years to build this channel. And I said, Corinne, why are you giving me this? I don't deserve this. And she said, you were the first one that said, we shouldn't do it that way. We should look at another way to do this. And you were the first citizens that came to me and said, we're not going to listen to that. We want more information. And that was kind of exciting for me. I really felt like we had made our voices heard and, and had made a difference in our city and for our river. And uh, if you ever feel like you're not making a difference, call me because you are. Um, but anyhow, so we started looking at these green infrastructure things, and we've still lost a beautiful sandbar, but instead of this big giant structure, there are one foot tall, two foot tall, little check dams all the way down. So it slows the water down, gives it a chance to roll on itself and, and take out some of the velocity, and so you don't have these huge washout things. It just moves slower. And... Uh, I like to think that we helped save that 50-foot structure from being built. So when we start talking about the things that are right about Blue River and kind of move away from the history of doing things improperly, these are, oops, these are all uh, restoration projects that are going on in the watershed right now. And so Healthy Rivers has projects on the ground. Blue River Watershed Association has projects on the ground. Heartland Conservation has projects on the ground. Kansas City Wildlands has projects on the ground. Earth Riders Trails Association, the Erta guys, the bike guys, they've got crazy stuff in store. So there's a lot of things going on right now in the Blue River watershed. This is just some of the trail work that they've done on the bike trails um, along the Blue. I think that's my favorite. I don't know. This is probably my favorite. Isn't that pretty? 
I just love that one. I don't own this one. Um, so we are now at 1976 to 2016. So not very long. But you can definitely see that we have made some changes. We've gotten rid of some of the gray infrastructure and gone with some green. And so I think things do continue to get better. And one of the reasons that I think things continue to get better, why does this have the wrong date, is because of Blue River Rescue, which is not April 1st. It is April 7th, and it's not 2017, it's 2018. Um, so it's April 7th, two weeks. Um, and so this is a spot on Blue River just above, um, oh, what's the... What's the bar and restaurant that always leaves their dumpster open, Larry? What is that place? Coaches or something? What's that place called? Anyway. Indian yeah. I mean, yeah, they're, they're not doing that anymore. Okay. Well, this is right by Indian Creek. But the reason that we started doing Blue River Rescue was because of this. This is not a setup. This is just trash on Blue River. Oh, here's where I turned it all right. See, it says April 7th. So Friends of Lakeside Nature Center, who sponsors this event, is a stream team. And as you guys know, stream teams are a consortium uh, of the state of Missouri's MDNR, their Department of Natural Resources, the Missouri Department of Conservation, and the Conservation Federation of Missouri. Those three programs came together to create a stream team program, which is strictly an advocacy program for streams. We have an excellent program in water quality monitoring, we'll give you supplies for a river cleanup, all these kinds of supportive methods that the state can provide us as volunteers to advocate for streams. So in uh, February of 1991, Lakeside Nature Center adopted uh, six miles of Blue River from 63rd Street to the boundary at in in Swope Park where Swope Park and Jackson County Parks meet and that was that was the first adoption by 93 we had increased the adoption to the headwaters of Indian Creek and now we have actually increased that adoption all the way down to 23rd Street where Blue Valley Park is located um, so the stream team adoption now covers um, 11 miles so we will work on Blue River Rescue with three sections of river, about 25 different work sites, and we'll have infrastructure in place for 1,000 volunteers. It's the largest one-day stream cleanup in our state. So when you arrive, it looks something like that. And there are hundreds and hundreds of people, and they are all signed in and off the property in less than an hour. Our sign-in team is unbelievable. All kinds of people participate. We have families. We have groups, neighborhood associations, student groups, corporate groups, groups from Bayer, groups that eat lunch, and some pretty exceptional totals. Um, I'm not sure when these were compiled. I did not recompile for this, but um, to think that two 1,443 tons of trash have been removed by anybody for any reason is pretty spectacular. That and the thousands of trees and the acres of honeysuckle. Those are th three numbers we're really proud of. But our power truly is in the partnerships that we maintain. This happened to be a, a, a project that we did with Bridging the Gap. Um, that's a very younger me and a younger Linda Lairbaum right there. I think that's Bill. Um, but uh, we've been doing these things for a long time. So uh, we will go a little bit behind the curtain of how this particular cleanup is done. And that is because first we have to survey. So we walk every inch of every site that we're going to send people to. We know what's there ahead of time. And we walk and walk and walk and survey and survey and survey. Sometimes we're surveying things like this. Looks like a setup picture. It was not. I hate this picture. This just irks me every time I see it. Um, and then this one, where it blows into this honeysuckle screen 
and never makes it to the water because it's caught up in the invasive species before it gets down there. So I guess that's a place where it's working. Um, but when we survey, we see the darndest things. We see things like a dumpster floating down the middle of Blue River. We see cars. <coughs> we see boats that we eventually get. Uh, that's a car. And the dump sites. And more dump sites. And now we're going to put some people in the dump sites for scale. So you can see how big the dump sites are. That's me. This is probably one of my favorites because this is a Google Earth map. And that's a dump. And that's a dump. And that's a dump. From Google Earth, from a satellite, you can see trash dumps. Astounding. Sometimes when you're really lucky, you get to survey with goats. <laughs> They're actually goats are fun to survey with. Um, and then I did want to talk to you guys a little bit about site leadership because all of you are qualified to be a site leader. As you can tell, it's a very important job. You have to wear the vest. This is the vest that you have to wear. You generally get a groovy shirt. This is a leader shirt. Um, Larry's wearing the shirt this year wherever Larry is. And then we definitely try and have a three deep leadership plan so that you have a site leader, your site leader has a section leader, and your section leader has a leader of those people too. So we're using the, oops, we're using the three, you see three, one, two, three, and of course we have the 11 year old on top because they're smarter than the rest of us. Um, our leadership team from two years ago. So when you walk in, it kind of looks like this, and everyone looks about as confused as those people do. That is just the most confused person picture I could find. Um, it does look a mess until you walk in the morning of the event and it's all laid out. Everything you need to do your site is in front of your sign, and you take it all to your car. So if you need cones, we're going to give you cones. If you need a shovel, we're going to give you a shovel. You need a pulley system, we're going to find one of those for you. If you need a gator with a crazy site leader with a vest on her head, we will give you one of those. We will send a tire trailer when your tires are ready. If you need a boat, we'll get you one. If you need a bigger boat, we'll get you one of those. And then we have trucks. And then we have bobcats and bigger bobcats and really big bobcats and really, really big bobcats, and we'll bring in a tow truck, we'll weed with a crane. If one crane isn't enough, we'll bring two. And at the end of the day, it all goes in a trash truck. So we will send between 50 and 75 tons of trash to the landfill in a day. And we do that with individuals, with small groups, and all of it with people really just working together to get this kind of stuff done. The places along the blue are beautiful, just beautiful places. You can't imagine. You'd think you were not even anywhere near Kansas City. So that at the end of the day, it's all piled up and ready to be taken and properly disposed of. Um, we talked a little bit um, these folks are, are loading trash trucks as well. Um, Jackson County Parks, Kansas City, Missouri Parks and Rec, and then Kansas City, Missouri Public Works all provide trash trucks for us on that day. Um, we talked a little bit about Byram's Ford and about the battlefield. And I'm not going to try and get into battlefield um, uh, logistics because there are two soldiers in here right now who would probably laugh at me. but. Anyway, um, I will let them tell their own stories, and the Westport Historical Society has great, great battle stuff if you're interested in the Battle of Westport. But this puts us on the ground on the site. So the part that we're going to be talking about is right in here, just for information. So on Wednesday, March 30th, we went, in 2005, we went out and we surveyed it. And you can see what's there. It's just everywhere, dumps and litter. It's all over the place. And then this is Saturday, April 2nd, and it is clean as a whistle. 
I would like to call your attention to that bunch of trees. Because the next day when I took my husband and kids out to show them what a great day we had, that's what was there, right in those trees, 24 hours. I took those pictures to the parks board and they listened to us. And the next year we had Jersey barriers at our disposal. We could block access to places. All of a sudden they were letting guys and equipment do donuts before they left instead of leaving it all nice and smooth when they, when they were finished with a spot. So the city really got behind the project and, and it really helped us a lot. Um, this is Blue Banks Park. I think we pulled 700 tires out of this space in a day. But to this day, it's still clean. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about tires because tires are a big problem on Blue River. We are a dumping ground for tires. We get anywhere between 1,000 and 2,000 tires a year. 1,500 tires is about normal for what we do in a year. And all of those tires are moved by hand. So we have tire crews that do nothing but pick up tires. They take those tires, put them on their trailer, which they load properly, and they take those trailers to the tire trailer and load it. In the case of this particular year, this truck is full and this is what was extra laying on the ground. So we had to have a second truck that year. But at the end of the day, like our friend Janie is going to show, you feel pretty darn good about yourself. Um, but as we talk about the blue, we, we often um, think about the hazards or, or, or think about the things that aren't so great about the blue or water quality or wastewater treatment plants or all those kinds of questions. But if you really start looking around, the blue is a beautiful place. You are smack in the middle of the second largest urban park in the country when you put Jackson County Parks and Swope Park together. And all you have to do is kind of look around. Um, these were all taken on a rescue day. That's just some bark. That guy was waiting on a, on a leaf or on a stick for some folks. That's a May apple getting ready to pop. This is the happiest I've ever seen my niece in my whole life. We uh, found a turtle while we were on the river that day. Eggs from a, um, a kill deer. Well, geranium, bluebells. Look at these guys. And so I will give you this one as the end. And the reason I give you this as the end is look at that patient woman. This kid had that red bag and picked up balls all day long, baseballs and tennis balls. And, and by the end of the day, he was exhausted, could carry nothing, and his mom's still tromping along with her bag full of balls while he just went right behind her. So... Um, with that, I will take any questions that you have, and I appreciate very much your time. No questions. No questions? Cool. Thank you for what you're doing. Do we have any tire dumpster targeting for We do have a tire dumpster for <clears throat> Vicki, have you floated the river? Have you canoed it? I have not canoed it. I've walked most of it. I haven't canoed it. I've canoed. Yeah. <laughs> I've canoed Brush Creek and I've canoed the Blue. I've canoed Brush Creek, not all of it, but I've canoed Brush Creek. Hi, Brush Creek. Vicki, Vicki, how do you fund everything? Do you get grants or in-kind services from companies or has it a lot of things going on in the project? How do you cover all the expenses? Um, by constantly fundraising to do everything that we do. Uh, one thing that is extremely helpful is the relationship we have with our stream team program in the state. And the stream team covers us for t-shirts, trash bags. What, we buy a thousand trash bags today, cost us $300. So getting 500 trash bags from them really helps us a lot. Um, but it's a mix of, of um, local support, both government and corporate support, and then support from individuals that funds it. And it's different every year. And it's different every year. There is no steady stream. 
Yeah. So to speak. So I mountain bike over there off of Blue Ridge and um, Blue River Road, and yeah. it, there's uh, some structures in there on those trails, and they call that, I think they said the White House. Do you know what those um, old structures would be in, what those would have been? The, like the tree house that's down no, by? No, it's just like some, um, it's like an old road that goes right across Blue River Road, and you can see a long stretch of the river. It kind of looks like what you have right there, but there's some old um, structures on those mountain biking trails. I and somebody said they called it the White House. I don't know. Okay. Thanks for asking a question I don't know, because now I'm gonna have to go find it. <laughs> right. is, is there any trash up there? Yeah, really, we gotta go start looking for trash. Phil, did I see your hand too? I thought so. Uh, kind of related to the first question, where does the heavy equipment come from? The bobcats, the dump trucks, that sort of thing? Generally, it's public works or water services. That's city public works? Thank yeah. you. We used to, um, Bill, we had a relationship with the National Guard for many years. Um, and they would come out and use the rescue as a training opportunity to use their equipment. But then the first year, I think it was 2002 maybe, they were deployed and we've never gotten the relationship back. So it, it was a really good one because they had some really good toys to play with and they liked using them. So it was really, a, it was good for both of us. And it varies quite a lot as to what equipment we're gonna needed. need from year yeah. to year. And we have been able to get a lot of those historical dumps cleaned up. And then the Jersey barriers put up. Really So dumb. that they're, they're not repeated. But uh, still every year we need all, you know, We'll need bobcats. We'll need clam trucks. Have you done the surveys? Started, not finished them. We, we used to do surveys in January and February, and it's not worth doing them then. It changes so much. The first nice weekend, we call him dude. He gets out, he cleans out his garage, and he leaves it on the side of Blue River Road every year. Um, so we just wait for the weather and, and survey a couple weeks out. So what's on the side of the road is going to change. But one thing we have seen this year so far is that uh, with the flooding this summer, all the floodplains are feet. smashed. So there was lots of water up, and there's lots of floaty stuff that's been left in the drift piles. Way high. So there's more of that floaty trash this year yeah, than we've probably ever seen. And we just won't get it all. Right. We never do. And... <laughs> People ask me, you've been doing it for 25 years, when is it gonna be clean? Well, the answer is never. never. Because <laughs> of how the trash gets in there. It's a renewable resource, unfortunately. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's got the road alongside of it, so people dump on it. Are you waving, Mike? I can't talk. Hang on a second, Mike. Let me. So Vicki, behind you in that poster, the lower right hand corner is a cute little picture of a little boat. Where where was where is that? Fifteenth Street. This one? Yeah. Yes. That one. Okay, thanks. That is beautiful. So yeah. all all of that boathouse stuff was like from eighth to seventeenth street. Mm -hmm. Wow, you can drive that area It's the concrete reach now. Right. It's it's been it's a paved channel. It's a paved channel. It's concrete. It's much better now. The, uh, you know, uh, Kessler's plan was great, and the Parks Department actually approved it in uh, whenever it was, 1907 or 03. Or, but uh, they didn't get the funding, and World War II ha uh, one happened, so it never got built. Right. And then the flooding continued and continued. They had the Five Lakes plan. Three of them were supposed to be in Kansas, and Kansas would not build them. They would have been at the out there at Coffee Creek and and uh, uh, Wolf Creek, but uh, those areas right now are full of quarter million dollar homes. So you can see why they didn't want to build them. 
but their, their compromise and their channelization, they wanted to handle the 100-year flood. It's really only designed now to handle the 30-year flood, but as a lot of this engineering goes, it's actually handling more than it was designed for. Right. We had two 500-year floods, and there were only a few spots that, that still flooded. Uh, uh, I can't remember their name. That apartment complex on Blue River Road. Yeah, the, uh, the bar on well, right. Yeah, but but on, on Blue River, where they've done the channelization work, right. Vance Brothers flooded, but... Uh, the one across the road on coal mine, I can't remember the name of it. They did not. Can't remember the name of that company. Uh, but they've been in uh, one of the stakeholder meetings forever. It's and, John uh, Patrick's company, right? Yes. And so some of those guys were saying, you know, for the first time, it rains at night, and I can stay in bed yeah. and sleep and not worry about all the things that they had built in the floodplain. <laughs> so, <laughs> any other questions? Are you clapping on your way out, Sean? Oh, no, it's not Sean. Oh, it's no. Bill Graham. Good oh. to see you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, Vicki, I know that your biggest project right now is cleaning up, but what other projects are in the works for the rivers? Anything in the works right now? Absolutely. And second question is, you have a lot of pros with people that help you and cooperate with you. Who do you butt, butt heads with the most that Who doesn't do want to? Who do butt heads with? Yeah, people that you have to you don't right. understand your, right. where you want to go with the projects we do. I appreciate that question. Mm -hmm. um, you guys kind of know me, and I'm not very good at keeping my mouth shut, nor do I have a very good poker face. So I have the ability to say things like, are you telling me you are building this on science when I was 17? <laughs> and they go, yeah. Um, I think we are getting through. I think as the as some of the engineering grays out in our city and in our consultants um, a lot of the new stuff is green infrastructure and so it is an opportunity for us to do that kind of work um, we are right now working a lot at blue valley park there's an uh, remnant oxbow there of blue river which is a really unique kind of habitat for an urban area it's actually a cut off s of the river cut off bend Still has hydrology, still holds water, still holds fish. Um, so we're doing a big honeysuckle restoration there, and then we're going to replant some natives. So that's one that we're doing right there right now. Wildlands has been whacking at honeysuckle along the river, along Blue River, for 10, 15 years. I mean, in, in some sense, that's hard. Um, but as far as people who we butt heads with, I really don't think those have existed for a really kind of a long time. We don't always see eye to eye, but we have enough um, of a voice now that the city listens when we talk. And I don't mean we like me, like I have a better voice than someone else here. When citizenry talks, the city's listening. I find that anyway. Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying, I don't understand that. That makes no sense to me. Explain that to me again. And we've done that a lot. And sometimes their explanations show them things, too. I, I would say that there is uh, one recurring theme that where we seem to butt heads every year, and that's with household hazardous waste. Oh. Who knows we're coming and knows we're bringing it but is continually flabbergasted on the amount of stuff we bring. And they want an address for everything, so. <laughs> but I came in so. two years ago with a truck full of hospital, su hospital supplies and paint. And this man said, did you just clean out your garage? <laughs> and I said, no. Well, well, I need to know the address. And I said, Blue River Road, side of. 
we've already got a report of half a pickup truck full of paint. Right. That's a spot that's been dumped. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, Rob picked that up. <laughs> there was an article where Rob had already, from HHW, uh, picked some paint up a week ago. Well, I used some of his spray paint today. No, I meant on, on Blue River, he did a cleanup. Yep. <laughs> So any comments that are made that are not on the microphone did not get recorded, no, right. but uh, <laughs> it did it did remind me <laughs> your comment that the paint had already been picked up. Uh, we kind of stopped telling water services ahead of time where the large dumps were, because we would assign volunteers for it and find out that they had gone cleaned it up the week ahead of time. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's great when you've got a bunch of guys going, where are the tires? <laughs> like, oh, well, they're not here. You don't let those guys go, ever. <laughs> well, I appreciate all of your help. I will see all of you bright and early, 7.30 in the morning, so you can be site leaders. It's really fun. It really is. Free, well, thank free, you guys for the opportunity. You get a free shirt like this. Appreciate it's beautiful. it.